In a recent interview with producer of the new Pet Cemetery movie, Lorenzo de Bonaventura, he says that their movie will have much more in common with Stephen King's novel than the 1989 film. We're not remaking the first film. This film represents a much deeper exploration of the book's themes. Our storytelling approach differs greatly from that of the original film. The new Pet Cemetery film, according to its producer, is focused on the relationship between family and death. We're more insulated to death today than we were in the 80s, the producer says. We hide from death, and when people in our lives get sick and are near death, we hide from them or send them away. How far are you willing to go as a parent to protect your family from death, to prevent it from happening, and to fight it? When comparing the two films, the producer says the new Pet Cemetery film is much more psychologically based than its predecessor. This film is about psychological terror. The story is emotional and feels very real. We embrace the surreal aspect of Stephen King's novel, which is something that's been overlooked in previous King adaptations. When I mention the emotional aspect of the film, a lot of that comes from the three wonderful actors we have in our movie. He continues, referring to Jason Clarke and Amy Simetz, who play Lewis and Rachel Creed, along with John Lithgow as Judd Crandall. They brought so much drama and emotion to their characters and the film, and I know that audiences are going to be very impressed. Filming went very well. We have a great script and phenomenal actors. Hey there guys, my name is Christian and before I go into this whole analyzing thing, if you will, let me tell you why, that after a while I suddenly felt the need to do so, even though I've never posted a video like this before, it's just not really what I'm used to. Anyway, some weeks have now gone by since the first teaser trailer for next year's Pet Cemetery movie went online. I'm a huge fan of Stephen King and I'm so happy about the incredible renaissance for King's work starting to be given the proper care that it, for the most part, didn't really get prior. I love Pet Cemetery. I've read it twice and also just got finished hearing the newly released audio version read beautifully by actor Michael C. Hall. For those who didn't know, an unabridged audio version of Pet Cemetery had never been released before. Late March of this year marked the very first time this book was ever released on audio. And let me just tell you up front, it's fucking terrifying. Moving on. As a huge fan of King's work, it can't come as much of a surprise that It Chapter 2 is one of my most anticipated of 2019. The same can be said for the Pet Cemetery remake because I am curious as hell. But I was personally truly disappointed with this first teaser trailer we just got for many reasons which I'll explain. Don't cut me off just yet, this isn't going to be me hating on everything, not at all. It might sound a bit like that for the first portion of this video, but I promise I am going to flip the script. All of this is meant to have a higher purpose, so please consider sticking with me through this. I will move forward towards the positive and everything else, but in order for me to set the stage for the rest of this video, it's needed that I get this out of my system first so you fully understand where I'm coming from. So, the teaser trailer, at first glance, really did temper my expectations there for a while, guys, and believe me, I get zero joy out of admitting that, but sadly it did. Now, with the short time that has since passed, I can honestly say that my frustration has settled somewhat down again. I'm beginning to see things clear and in a more positive light once again, and you better believe there's a strong reason for that. I'm still holding on to the fact that the teaser trailer itself pretty much sucked for me, but yeah, that hasn't really changed. But I am, however, beginning to not care too much. Now, when I started to cross-examine the trailer's separate images very closely in conjunction with the same scenarios in the book, which is also very fresh in my mind, because as I was saying, I just got finished hearing the audio version of the whole thing. So when I did that, I began to suddenly get an idea for just how come this trailer is what it is and why. Something that through my frustration I couldn't spot in the beginning. But first, I need to give you guys my initial first thoughts upon seeing the teaser trailer for the very first time. It's easiest for me to simply list those disappointments one at a time, starting with the first of three, so here goes. Fake jump scares. We started out the trailer with the typical fake, loud jump scare when that truck drove by. Yes, I know the truck going by with the thunderous sound was a foreshadowing of dark things to come. As any lover of the book, I'm well aware of that. 
but those ear-deafing, absolutely over-exaggerated sounds are so not necessary. Nope, I did not in any shape or form exaggerate that for this video. The volume here is just as it is in the trailer itself and it's annoying as hell. It's not a good first sign if they wish to promote what in their minds, if that interview with the producer I talked about in the very beginning is any indication, is supposed to be a confident, strong, and anything but your average typical horror film. These fake jump scares quickly comes off as desperate for any horror movie. The source material is just about the creepiest ever written. The story itself is so powerful and too damn good for it to rely on fake jump scares. But I am gonna remain totally fair here, cause they might, if we're lucky, tone it down for the film itself, as they did in the case of last year's magnificent It. So just for comparison's sake, look at this little piece from the very first trailer for It. It's definitely over-exaggerated, yes, so the It trailer is guilty of doing the same thing as the Pet Cemetery one. But now, look how that same scene went down within the movie itself. Oh! Hi, Georgie. It's a completely different sound effect from the one used in the trailer, and a bit more toned down. Even the visual itself has been altered here. In the trailer, he pops up from below, whereas in the movie, he's already there in the dark to the left side and you simply see his eyes open. Point being, a lot could still end up being altered from how it's seen in the trailer to how it'll actually be within the movie itself. It was a good example of this, so let's pray Pet Cemetery does something similar. In It's case, though, it just took its time to build momentum, tension, and fear around the whole scenario. And when that clown then emerged, the danger was real, not fake. So do not misunderstand me, because I don't mind me some jump scares, but you've gotta earn them. Make them count. And for the love of freaking God, don't fake them. I pray the movie itself will steer clear of these, and that truck certainly didn't need such a false effect of that magnitude. Now, I'm not saying the old movie is any masterpiece by any means, however, it does remain to this very day one of the absolute few horror films I still can't watch alone without getting seriously creeped out. Anyway, that's not the point. I just want you to take a little look-see here how they portray the very first encounter with those trucks within the old movie. Can we at least agree that the danger of the road and the trucks in that scene is just as clearly stated, and that they managed to do so without any fake loud noise with the only purpose of making you spill popcorn all over yourself for no real reason? I mean, does anybody want that? In fact, I'd say it's even more effective in the old movie here, cause Gage is so damn near death already in that scene making your stomach hurt, whereas in the new movie apparently, the mom is just standing with Gage safely in her arms from a much greater distance. However, the mom standing with Gage in her arms is actually also how it is in the book, but that's just one example where I honestly think the old movie did it a notch better. Moving on. Rabbit jerky motion effects. What's with that? It's all over this trailer. Just like fake jump scares, it just comes off as unnecessary and cheap, not to mention in this very case completely meaningless and in complete opposite direction of the source material. By the way, those sort of effects is something I remember from 15 some years ago made popular in films like The Ring and Grutch. Can we please move on now? I mean, this element is so freaking played out, and especially for this very story and this subject matter, it is utterly pointless, it really is. What the hell does those jerky motions have to do with anything remotely deep nor meaningful for the themes of Pet Cemetery? Let me answer that one for you. Nothing. 
It's got nothing to do with the themes, and this trailer relied so heavy on it. This was just another element that took me completely out of the trailer. It's like the focus was in all the wrong places. You may think otherwise, and that's totally cool, but I was instantly bored with it. Kids in animal masks. Clearly a whole new added sub-layer that wasn't part of the source material nor the original movie. Those kits filled most of this trailer, turning their heads in monstrous rabid motions as if they're some evil little children of the corn-like cult. The trailer here makes it seem as if this movie is going to be some generic, sinister, 17, uninspired horror flick when everyone involved in this film is promising something unique. Might still be, but the trailer is not showing it. Every cheap trick used, whether it being creepy kits and masks, jerk motions, fake jump scares, whatever, it's been seen a billion times before, and this is a fact. And while I do respect everyone's opinions, I just gotta be honest here. I can't personally, for the life of me, understand how the hell something so generic can impress anyone anymore. Anyway, uh, <laughs> those three issues I stated had me worry a lot. The movie itself might still turn out absolutely great and God knows that I am rooting for it like crazy. But this here trailer, guys, in my opinion, did not make the movie look as if it'll stand out amongst the crowd as being something great. You need to remember that I'm not dissing a movie I haven't seen yet, I'm not. I'm simply stating my disappointment in a trailer that I have seen, something that was supposed to excite and thrill me, convincing me that this was 30 years worth waiting for. But because of those elements stated, which felt so much in this trailer, sadly it failed to do that. Even for a teaser trailer, which I know is not meant to give people some elaborated piece of storytelling, this particular promotional piece was all over the place as if it was edited in a fucking blender. It left me with a feeling that the prime focus was misplaced, making it feel like some whole other movie. It made things look generic and quite frankly, rather dated already. But now guys, I'm gonna start flipping the script. Cause after two some weeks of pure frustration, watching the trailer a couple of more times, again and again and again, I started to realize something. This trailer, and everything that's involved within it, and why it's crafted in the extreme fast, on the surface, confusing way that it is, is more than likely on purpose. I began to see things, which has led me to believe that all of it is designed to throw us off track, and here's the kicker. It's not to throw the general movie-going audience off the track, because they've got nothing to compare to anyways. I believe it's deliberately designed to throw fans of the source material off the track. Which leads me into my next portion of the video, once again turning my view of the upcoming movie, not the trailer, but the movie itself, towards the more positive. Know that I'll be heading into heavy spoiler territory in this section, discussing specific things from the book, and therefore naturally also spoiling significant stuff in one way or the other from the upcoming film. If you don't care and already know the material in and out, stick with me. But maybe I might actually be hitting the nail on the head here about a certain and rather big change that the filmmakers might have made to this upcoming new adaptation. Something that could end up still surprising and shocking fans of the source material just when they thought they knew everything that's coming. If you don't want to go down this rabbit hole with me, I'd advise you to bail now too. So, the filmmakers being the two directors, Kevin Kolsch and Dennis Whitmire, has said in interviews that their new adaptation will in many ways be much truer towards the novel, but that they will be revamping some stuff while still saying they'll be, and I quote, staying true to the essence of King's book. What could that really mean? What does those rules for which they have set up for themselves allow them to do then? What things could they possibly be shaking up for us, and how could they, with everything already known to fans, still fuck with us? I didn't think too much about this stuff before the trailer dropped. Now, after pausing for every single little rapidly paced image within the teaser trailer examining them, something within multiple images hidden in plain sight began to strike me. What if their little daughter Ellie is the one who's gonna die in this new movie and not Gage? 
What? What the hell are you talking about, man? That is what you're thinking, right? They'd never do something that stupid. It's too radical a change from the novel. Are you crazy? Well, is it though? Would it really be that radical? Let it sink in for a while and tell me this. What's more heartbreaking to you? Seeing a three-year-old kid run over by a truck? Or option number two? Seeing an eight-year-old girl run over by a fucking truck. Do you want to play God on that one and decide what's more tragic? Because I sure as hell refuse to make that choice. It's a parent's child for a child, for heaven's sake. A tragic, heartbreaking kill for a kill. Three years or eight doesn't matter. Well, yeah, but that's not even the point, idiot, you might think. It just wouldn't make sense within the story and context of the book. It would ruin stuff. Why? I ask again. And one does need to think about it for more than just a minute before answering as I did. Because at first thought, yes, it does seem like a radical change for those loving the book, but think out of the box. Why couldn't it work? I've been given this a lot of thought, and you know what? I do think it could work, and I actually think it could work surprisingly well. Revamping things that initially seem like a radical departure, but when closer examined, it really isn't. And, as the filmmakers have stated, it would still be in the true essence of the original story. It's all about the loss of your little kid. Period. Just think for a minute what extra dramatic and emotional effect it could have, in my opinion, if Ellie was too seen running to save Gage's life ahead of Lewis who would be way behind. Ellie reaches Gage, pushing him out of the road in the very last second, saving her little brother but facing the oncoming truck herself, head smashed first. Instead of Lewis Creed flying the kite with little Gage on a beautiful summer day as in the book in the old movie, instead here in this new adaptation, it's Ellie flying the kite with her kid brother. For the smallest of moments, she's the one who's not attentive enough to Gage, causing him to reach the road. Lewis still notices, of course, just as seen in the trailer and sets off screaming and running towards both of them. Ellie notices her father running in panic, causing her to turn around yet again, seeing her brother nearing the road. She herself sets off running towards Gage, and with her advantage apart from her dad, she reaches her brother. Lewis stumbles in the grass just before, looking up just in time to see his daughter suffer the consequences. Gage survives with minor bruises. Ellen Creed is dead. Okay, okay, enough of that shit. Start putting the pieces together, Sherlock Holmes. What makes you think this is even remotely possible? First, just remember that I'm not saying this is necessarily how it's gonna go down at all, and I'm fully aware there's a risk involved. But here's my detective work, if you will, the stuff that by closer examination led me to believe that they might actually end up killing Ellen Creed in this one instead of Gage. We start with this, because when talking about small nuggets of iconic imagery from the teaser trailer, the stuff that makes fans of the source material take notice and say, hey, I recognize that, well, then this image here is definitely one of those. In the very quick glance we do get in the teaser, one might instantly be thinking Gage's funeral, or maybe their housekeeper, Missy Dandridge, who commits suicide in the old movie. Maybe not. Maybe it's Judd Crandall's wife, Norma, right? Nevertheless, no matter how I tried putting the different scenarios together here, certain things simply did not add up for me in one way or the other. Let's start with Gage, and why it just doesn't fit, literally. Clearly, that coffin is way too big for a three or even four-year-old. And where's Ellie? No, those seen here are not Ellie. They don't resemble her, they're too tall to be her, and even if she was one of them, she wouldn't be standing there, she'd be right up next to her mom and dad. Those seen here are either cousins or friends from the neighborhood. Yes, I know that Gage is nowhere to be seen either, but no matter what, it is not Gage inside that size of a coffin. Could it be an eight or nine year old? Yeah, I'd buy that. But couldn't it be Missy Dandridge or Norma Crandall, you might ask? I highly doubt it. Not unless they're the same height as Ellie Creed. You'll understand that one in a moment. So how did I manage to make any sort of valid measurements out of things? So glad you asked. First know that the following here has simply been measured with a ruler directly on my computer in full screen. That is how I went about it with every image. All is measured from the same full screen size proportion. 
In doing this, if only I'd based things on one image alone with nothing else to compare to, obviously that would be too vague. But I found another image from earlier on in the trailer that I definitely could use to pair a certain thing up with and that alone was enough. Even if this following measurement isn't 110% accurate, in this case, it's still enough to judge by and I think you're gonna see that. So here we see Ellie standing next to her dad in front of their new house, Lewis's arms hanging pretty much straight down his side. Next to him, of course, stands his daughter, reaching as high as right around the dead center of Lewis's biceps, actually. That right there, people, no matter how close in, or in this case, how far away we are, they're still seen standing right next to one another. Therefore, it's valid enough for one to get a pretty good assessment as to just how tall Ellie seems to be, not measured in centimeters, but at the very least when standing next to her dad, right? Now back to the funeral again. When measuring that image in full screen on my computer in a complete simplistic way with a ruler, from approximately that same center of Lewis's bicep and down, it was 8 centimeters. Then I measured the coffin's top lid from corner to corner. This lid was 9 centimeters. So take those 8 centimeters of Ellie's length, you know, in quote marks, judging from when she stands next to her daddy, and throw those into the coffin? It would only leave very little room to spare at both her feet and above her head, as it's meant to. But couldn't that still be Norma Crandall or Missy Dandridge in there? If, by the way, she's even in the film, cause she ain't listed as part of the cast on IMDb. But even so, my strong guess would still be, no, it's not her. Not unless Dandridge or Norma is no higher than 8-year-old Ellie in this movie. And would you dare to say even lower, maybe? What are they, dwarfs? Of course not, let's get real. And if they'd be any higher than Ellie, they also wouldn't be able to fit in that coffin. So you see, we can sort of already scratch off both Missy Dandridge and Norma Crandall here. And if for some reason, despite everything already discussed, some of you are still pondering over whether it could be one of those two ladies, then as I said earlier, no matter the case, something just doesn't fit about that scenario. So for a second, okay, let's just dismiss the fact that the coffin itself is simply too small and instead try to look at all the other hidden clues in that image that should, as a true fan, immediately make your alarm clocks go off, thinking it's highly unlikely for it to be either of those two gals. If it was Missy Dandridge's funeral, Rachel, who's clearly seen here standing next to Lewis, wouldn't be there to begin with. She doesn't want to deal with death in any shape or form at this point in the story. It's a huge part of her character in both the book and old movie, and I'm gonna elaborate a lot more on that in the next image. In the book and old movie, Lewis takes Ellie to that funeral, while Rachel stays home absolutely sick to her stomach. Only difference being that in the book, it's Norma who died, whereas in the old movie, Norma wasn't in it, so they did a switcheroo and instead had Missy Dandridge commit suicide, and she was the one they went to the funeral for. But in both cases, though, it was Ellie that Lewis brought with him. Rachel stays home. But Ellie isn't there in this image, and Rachel is. And if it was Norma Crandall in that coffin, then what the hell is Judd Crandall doing all the way back there? When, of course, if it be the case of his dead wife, he'd be right up in front by her coffin where, funny enough, Lewis and Rachel instead stands. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that is John Lithgow as Judd Crandall standing there. Lithgow is a tall dude, standing at 6 foot 4, or 1.93 centimeters, so it fits. Either way, when roaming the image, he's the only one that could be Judd. Lastly for this image, it's just a tiny other little thing, but look at that yellow heart shape. Tell me that doesn't look an awful lot like a classic teddy bear right there in the middle of it. Complete speculation here, but maybe that's Gage's teddy bear that he wanted big sister Ellie to have, as in saying, thanks for saving my life, sis. Maybe? Just a thought. Gage, as seen in the teaser trailer, I don't know, he just seems more vocally able to communicate with his parents, and that of course will be needed if the roles of Ellie and Gage is ultimately reversed in this version of the story. Ellie in the book and the old movie is the one having dreams of Pet Cemetery, right? She's the one who's contacted by Victor Pascal foreshadowing to her all the dark things lying ahead if something isn't done. 
She communicates all this both to her dad and especially to mommy during the last part of the story when she and Rachel go alone to stay with the grandparents for a while after Gage's death. It is here that Ellie communicates to her mom that something back home is very, very wrong. There's a reason that Daddy wanted them to go stay with the grandparents for a while. Daddy is about to do something very bad. Look at this picture again from the trailer. It's Victor Pascal standing there in the dark and Rachel with Gage in her arms. In the book and old movie, it's not until the very end, especially when they're at Rachel's parents' house, that she herself starts feeling the presence of Victor. And at that point in time, Gage is supposed to be dead. But not if this picture is anything to judge by. It should be Ellie there, not Gage. You might be thinking, well yeah, but how can you be sure that this very image from the trailer is also from that specific last part of the story you're referring to? And you're right, I can't be sure. But see, here's the thing. When piecing stuff together, even for this new unseen adaptation, I can't for the life of me seem to make anything fit as to why, at a place in the story where both Gage and Ellie are still alive, how come Victor Pascal would reveal himself in any way to Rachel, whom up until the last section of the story has been completely shut off from anything death-related. That's all because of the trauma of the events that occurred with her sister Zelda dying from spinal meningitis back when Rachel herself was just a little girl. She's completely shut off from death. She doesn't want to deal with it. She's terrified of it. It's a major part of the book, and that's also a strong part of the point that's going to sum up everything in a moment. There's a reason why Victor Pascal mainly tries to warn them all through Ellie. In the book, that is, because she's not closed off in that same way. And Pascal knows that Lewis himself is way out of reach at this point in the story. So he tries desperately to communicate through the only source that isn't completely shut off from hearing him. Ellie. And then maybe she can communicate it strongly enough to her mother so she'll understand that hell is coming for them. But in the book and old movie, when all of this takes place, it's during that final third act at a point where Rachel herself isn't quite so shut off from death anymore because she's been forced to deal with the loss of her own child dying earlier in the story. Only then she starts to feel the presence of something. She starts to listen. It all happens when Ellie freaks out, having bad dreams, desperately trying to get through to her mother. So here's that last part of the point. Even for this new adaptation, and given they keep the entire backstory of Rachel's character intact, which definitely is an element that'd be fucking stupid to change because it's so significantly powerful, well, then it doesn't make any sense for her to start feeling the power and spirits around her until that very end when they're at the grandparents' house. And that is just to really drive it home at a point in the story where Gage is supposed to be dead. But judging from this image here, Gage is very much alive in Mommy's hands and Ellie is nowhere to be seen. In the dark behind them stands a bloody Victor Pascal, simply trying to reach Rachel, warning her that it might be in her best interest to listen to her crying son when he woke up saying, Daddy is doing something bad. I saw Ellie, I saw Pet Cemetery, Mommy. And for argument's sake, let's just say this image here is from an earlier point in the movie where both children are still alive and all of them are happy and at home with Lewis. Even then, does it make any sense to you, with Rachel here clearly seen sensing Pascal's presence, that she would ever, later on, after the death of their child, just leave Lewis at home while they head off to her parents in Boston? I mean, would she ever do that then? I'm thinking, hell no. Oh, and I just had to throw this little thing into the mix. This is a complete nerd detail, but still, I, I have to give it a mention. In the book, Louis back home breaks into the cemetery to dig up his kid right around 11 at night. Take a closer look at Rachel's watch there. It's 11.05. Totally vague, I know, I'm, I'm just saying. Moving on to yet another very iconic image that's so striking and right out of both the novel and old movie. Gage, back from the dead, at home, going into his father's medical briefcase and taking out the scalpel. Look closer, and you really need to. 
Those hands, do they honestly look like that of a three or four year old to you? That scalpel, in my opinion, seems just too small when in the hands of what they want us to think is gauges. Could it simply be Lewis himself there taking out the scalpel? Yeah, I suppose it could, but I don't believe it is though. When and why in the movie would he have his scalpel out in his hands like that? The only scenario I could think of would be when Victor Pascal, with his skull cracked open, is brought into Lewis's medical office at the high school, where of course, he dies. We only get a quick glimpse of this sequence in the teaser trailer, but it is there. Still, it doesn't fit, cause the lighting is completely different from each other in those two images. The one with Pascal is lighted strongly, as things of course would be in a medical office, and the other one with the scalpel is very darkly lit. Therefore, these two images are clearly from two completely different scenes in the film. This one with the scalpel, I have almost zero doubt, is from the very last act of the movie, where Lewis's kid comes back from the dead, taking the scalpel out from the briefcase as Lewis himself is completely passed out on the bed sleeping heavily after the long night he just had carrying out his mission. The mission being to break in late night and dig up his dead kid from the cemetery. Next step, bring the body all the way up to the Micmac burial grounds where he'd spend hours in the middle of the night digging a hole in soil as hard as rock, neatly laying his dead kid down there, filling it up again. It's an iconic image, this one here. That, I believe, is the bed where Lewis is passed out sleeping and these hands here are those of Ellie's. Just for a short, somewhat comparison. Look how the scalpel fits inside the hands of Gage in the old movie. Looking at those images, the scalpel in the hands of Gage looks more like a huge freaking dinner knife. The scalpel here in this new trailer as seen in the hands of this mystery figure, it just looks much smaller and the hands way bigger. It just doesn't look quite right to me, I don't know. Lastly, we have this very iconic image from the source material, which of course also was in the old movie. These of the muddy footprints that Gage leaves on Judd's front porch. Again, when looking a bit closer at it, does it really seem to fit for you? I'm not gonna spend much more time on this very image though, cause it is pretty difficult to judge the physical dimensions of those floorboards and therefore also tough to judge an approx size of the footprints themselves. They just don't really strike me like those of three or four year olds. So there you have it. Can you honestly tell me that it couldn't work? And in fact, couldn't it maybe even add an extra layer of gut-wrenching, heartbroken horror to it all? Just when you thought it couldn't be more horrible, just close your eyes and try to picture it for a second. The very thought of an eight-year-old girl when the time came would not hesitate trading her own life in order to save her kid brothers. This is something that in my eyes only adds an extra tragic beautiful dimension to the testament that is the very core themes of Pet Cemetery: The strong bonds of family, their love, and how far one is willing to go in order to save their loved ones. I can honestly feel the pain and suffering like never before on that one. Also, to even further strengthen the thought of Ellie getting killed in this one is when you think about a father's special bond with his daughter, his firstborn. If they really are revamping stuff in this one, still wanting to shock fans, this could be one way of doing it. Ellie seems a bit more mature in this film when compared to the book and old movie. Being more mature, I think it can allow even further for us, the audience, being able to feel the special bond between father and daughter grow even more throughout the movie. They can put serious pressure on that bond, developing it as the movie progresses. We can see them having unique discussions with one another about love, family, death, how to deal with the loss of a lost one, the grief, all of it. The maturity of her allows them to do more in this one. It's, it's something the audience could truly sink their teeth into. And I know there's one talk in the book between Lewis and Ellie about death, yes, but they can really take it to a whole other level in this one, if they want to. If done right, it'll have us feel so strongly for their bond and their love. Everything could build to this intense point in the movie so that when she shockingly bites it on the road instead of Gage, it'll have us torn to pieces in ways we simply weren't prepared for. And then, when she comes back, 
And if it's like in the book where the dead only brings back with them all the hate and god-awful evil speakings, turning every single loving discussion they ever had earlier in the movie when she was alive, and twisting all that into monstrous death ramblings towards her old man, I swear I can feel my skin crawl already. When looking at the teaser trailer now, after all this shit I've been trying to piece together, and maybe I'm totally wrong, but I am more positively believing that Kits and Animal Masks was definitely a distraction just to draw fans' attention away from the stuff that the filmmakers so desperately, and rightfully so, are trying to hide from us. I don't think there'll be too much of a focus in the film itself, and when they're there, it's for a reason. Judd talks about kids that used to dare each other to go into the woods at night, as in, not anymore, not in our present time in the film. I really wouldn't mind such a flashback, and you know what? I don't even mind the animal masks they wear if it's just some weird tradition they've got going on and as long as when it's all finally presented in the movie, unlike in the trailer, it's just kids being kids going to the place they themselves build to bury their beloved pets. It's not an evil place, it's only what lies beyond that's evil. If they just draw that line very clear in the movie, then I'll be okay with it. Then there's the images of the kids in animal masks inside people's homes, and I thought, really? What the hell is this all about? And I do have a theory, granted it's just a theory, but I could see that these scenes would prove to be from a sequence in the movie, whereas, like in the book, it's actually Halloween. And maybe these masks has been left behind by previous generations, I mean, who knows? Anyway, Ellie could easily have friends in this version, and they dress up in these animal masks to honor the spirit of things, the myth, if you will. Earlier in the movie, Judd will have been taking them for a little hike to the pet cemetery, so Ellie would at this point also be updated on what it's all about. She might even find it cool and funny for her to dress up like that with her friends on Halloween just to honor the place. I stress these kits on Halloween because on imdb.com they actually have them listed as part of the cast. Halloween Kid 1 through 4. So I hope the stuff we see with these masks is very manipulative and not portrayed at all like it will be in the movie itself, simply to throw us off track. Same can be said for those jerky motion effects I hated so much. When looking real close at a kid rapidly moving his head, making it seem like they want to portray them as little psychopaths, I now see it's not just a kid's head turning rapidly, it's everything else in the entire image too. You especially notice it in the scene where the old lady is sitting in her chair rocking back and forth. Notice the steam coming out of the iron on the ironing board. It bursts along with her just as rapidly, meaning that whether it being the kids, her, or anything else in the trailer, they've literally cut out certain moving images to give it that choppy feel, speeding things up, wanting it all to come off as scary. It's not going to be that way in the movie, it's all manipulated just for the trailer. Even the sequence with the old lady rocking back and forth, I'll bet, is also manipulated just to have it stand out as something we should anticipate as being scary as hell when in the movie itself, I'm 98% for sure that this very sequence will not be an evil or scary one. In fact, quite the opposite. It'll be a sad one. The woman in the chair, I believe, is Norma Crandall, wife to Judd Crandall. In the book, she suffers a heart attack at one point and Lewis Creed comes to her rescue and they get her to the hospital. Something that in the book happens on Halloween night. Norma also slowly begins to show signs of senility and that is exactly what I believe could be happening in this here sequence in the movie. She turns on the iron in preparation to iron her husband's shirt. She sits down, forgetting she turned it on and all the while starts having a heart attack. That's my theory anyway, but they manipulate it all to look so damn scary because they gotta show us something, right? And they gotta do it without spoiling anything. It's all to throw us off track from all the other stuff they don't want us to see or notice. I really think that. This won't be an evil moment in the movie. It'll be a sad one. Judd eventually loses his wife. Or I could be totally wrong. This will be a scary scene in the film as Judd simply has visions of his dead wife coming back to fuck with him at the end but I really doubt that's the case. 
Either way, that scene in the trailer was chopped and sped up like crazy, it clearly shows. So, at the very least, it won't be like that in the movie. If that was the case, it would be pointless and the filmmakers then shouldn't have been given this property to begin with, because clearly, they had their focus up their ass. Also, it wouldn't fit at all with them saying they are gonna deliver a grounded and very real emotional story. But all things analyzed and considered, I do believe now that all this shit was just for the trailer. In light of everything I've pondered over, I get what the filmmakers are up against. I mean, even if you pretty much know what's to come or not, whether you know every dead person that comes back to life or don't, of course they don't want to spoil that. No matter if it's Ellie or Gage, or later on Rachel, they can't show any of them in their monstrous figures in a trailer or a TV spot, because it would ruin every single scary anticipation of seeing it for the first time in theaters. It's all too climactic, significant, spoilerish, and way too personally connected to the people we're gonna follow through the whole movie. This film, no matter how you look at it, really has much to hide, and as earlier discussed, maybe even more than initially thought. Even us fans who mostly knows what's to come, would you like to see these people in their undead forms before your ass is firmly seated in the movie theater? I personally would have a tough time concentrating on simply seeing these nice people's faces full of love and humanity for the duration of the movie if we in any trailers prior to the movie itself saw them back from the dead. Sitting in theaters, all I'd think about would be their dead faces and bodies, and of course the filmmakers don't want to put that stuff in our heads, so I get it now. For that same reason, I'm also betting that the scary sister of Rachel being Zelda, we're not gonna get to see up front in any trailers coming in the future. It would be a shame to ruin that reveal, cause sitting in theaters, every fan will be anticipating that character showing up, and those in the theater not familiar with Zelda, they've got a pretty nasty surprise coming, I'm betting. It's just one of those things, you know, that'll make us feel as if we're in little sister Rachel's shoes when she in the movie in a flashback for the first time is seen walking into that room where her clinically insane sister Zelda is being kept as a dirty little secret. And yes, there will be such a sequence included as young Rachel is too listed as part of the cast on IMDb. Plus, the filmmakers have also, in previous interviews, discussed this very scene, talking about how it would feel like for that little girl having to walk in there and feed her dying, spiteful, hateful sister. I mean, we don't want that shit ruined for us prior to the movie, do we? And the filmmakers, I'll bet, feel the same way. So if you ask me if we'll see her in any upcoming trailers, my answer is no. It's just too big of a thing to spoil just like that. I do believe, though, that there's a good chance that in the next trailer we might get to see maybe a hand or something reaching out for Rachel or latching out at her. Maybe we see something in the shadows creeping slowly in from behind with her dwarf-like distorted figure laying her skeleton-thin monstrous fingers slowly on Rachel's shoulder. Maybe we might even hear her whisper a line. Rachel, don't turn around. Or some creepy ass shit like that, you know? But a full reveal? Nope, I don't see us getting that, and honestly, I don't want one. Um, maybe we get a quick darkly lit shot from behind or something, but that'll be it, I'm betting. I don't really know what they're cooking up for the next trailer, but I do think it'll be just as shrouded in mystery as this very first teaser trailer. Probably a more story-based trailer, but still shrouded in mystery. I can only pray that the kits and masks won't have the main focus the next time, but exactly what they're gonna present to us without spoiling shit, I have no idea, and I do understand that it must be tough for the filmmakers. I think I'd be okay with a fast shot of a certain Timmy Baderman, you know, the flashback story told to Lewis by Judd. He's a minor side story element, a good one, but nonetheless a side story. So if they're gonna show any dead people up front in any future promotion, I think it would be wise to use him for a quick image or two. And that was pretty much it, guys. My long analyzing of the teaser trailer and every other little thought that's been circling inside of me ever since the release. This version, despite the lackluster of the teaser for me, could still turn out to be absolutely horrifying and emotionally effective as well. 
We need a human, psychologically and character-driven adult horror film bursting with as much love and heart as its gruesome counterpart. God knows that I have my fingers crossed. I might easily end up being totally wrong about everything discussed in this video. I might be reading way too much into things it wouldn't be the first time. And when that next full trailer does come, that alone could end up destroying every theory of mine and every image discussed. We'll just have to wait and see. But I want you to know that I really did try my best to do my homework before creating this video for you guys and I hope that some of you fans found it interesting enough. Closing things off, should you want to see it, I'm ending this whole video with my little fan edit of the teaser trailer, eliminating all the stuff I personally found cheap and generic and irritating in the official one, thereby bringing things back to the significant stuff that I actually think represents Pet Cemetery in its purest form, with the little stuff I had to work with, of course. Hope you can enjoy it for what it is. My name is Christian and this has been very fun for me. Thank you so much for watching and you have a great day. So many trees. It's beautiful, right? It's definitely not Boston. What do you think? This is ours? I even got him to throw in a whole forest as a new backyard. It was a myth. Those woods belong to something else. There's places where the dead speak. Don't go on, Doc. No matter how much you feel, you may have to. Do not go on to the place where the dead